My name is Frank Stilwell. It's my pleasure to be the uh, chair for this evening's proceedings and I, of course, welcome you all to hear uh, at Politics in the Pub with our special guest for tonight, Anthony Albanese. Um, <laughs> Politics in the Pub started here at the Harold Park Hotel on the in the month of April 1988 and the topic for the very first meeting was where is the ALP heading? <laughs> <laughs> well it's great to be visited. Uh, on, on that evening instead of the speakers were Julian Disney and Senator Arthur Geesund. Wow. We don't have a video recording of that, but in more recent times we've had excellent video recordings of all uh, speeches given at Politics in the Pub, courtesy of Cathy here, and uh, I would encourage you to have a look at the Politics in the Pub website. There's a pink program of future uh, talks uh, being circulated, but the website will give you continuity and further information about all forthcoming events, well worth having a look at. And even though Cathy is going to be taking up a job uh, as a film lecturer in Brisbane very shortly, we're hoping to maintain her role in conjunction with a local uh, camera person to try to keep this show going with that quality of both in-house activity and uh, good video access on, on the web. With the benefit of hindsight, I think uh, given that politics in the pub's been running for more than a quarter of a century, we should probably have patented the brand, uh, developed a franchise operation, uh, generated a steady stream of income, perhaps done some asset stripping, restructuring, financialization to put this show on a firmer, uh, or perhaps not so firm, long-term economic footing. We didn't, and so we continue to rely upon contributions to the running of politics in the pub from people who attend the events. So later on in the evening, a couple of uh, jugs are going to come round asking for contributions. So please put in whatever you can afford. Five dollars, ten dollars, nothing. Literally, whatever you can what afford. <laughs> Very acceptable. Thank you. Fifteen percent. <laughs> Yes. I will introduce uh, Anthony Albanese, although he probably doesn't need any significant introductions, being such a well-known figure in Australian politics. But uh, it is pertinent to note that uh, he grew up very close to here in uh, the, the Forest Lodge Camperdown area, uh, went to school locally, uh, lived with his, uh, his mum in the public housing, uh, subsequently went to uh, Sydney University where he studied political economy, which is the basis of my original contact with him. Uh, after... Tell him what a good student I was. Oh yeah, tell him what a good student I was. Tony was a good student. Is that all right? <laughs> uh, but that outstanding essay you never handed in... Uh, <laughs> It's got a, a, a long penalty mark uh, attached to it by now. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, uh, Anthony Albanese impressed me when he was at the University of Sydney, uh, partly because he was a good solid student in political economy, getting credits in most of his uh, courses, but also because he combined that with uh, activism on campus around a number of political causes, not least, of course, the struggle to uh, defend and extend the political economy program. And I brought along a book uh, called Political Economy Now, which tells the story of that struggle at the University of Sydney. And the book includes a photograph of the young Albo on the top of the clock tower at the main quadrangle during an occupation uh, uh, for which he was subsequently um, suspended from the university and put through some uh, uh, disciplinary proceedings which resulted in a light 
tap across the wrist and uh, much celebration uh, uh, as a result. And I, I hope there'll be an opportunity a little later on to ask uh, about the, the significance of, of those early political engagements. But of course his party political engagements were right there from the start. Uh, after graduating he went to work with uh, left Labour heavyweight Tom Uren as his uh, research assistant, uh, went subsequently uh, to be the Assistant General Secretary at the New South Wales ALP, that lonely left position, uh, following in the footsteps of John Faulkner, Bruce Childs and, and others. Uh, and uh, then he went on, of course, to become a Member of Parliament, first elected to the electorate of Grainler in 1996, and uh, going on to a, an array of uh, important positions within Labour opposition and Labour government. Manager of opposition business, leader of the House of Reps, uh, Minister for Infrastructure and Transport, for regional development, local government, broadband communications, digital economy, uh, and Deputy Prime Minister in the second Rudd government. And of course, subsequently, the people's choice within the ALP rank and file to become the uh, He's uh, currently Shadow Minister for Infrastructure and Transport, also for Tourism and Cities. Uh, and if all that sounds a bit mainstream Labour, it's also pertinent to note that uh, he's three-time winner of the Australian Parliamentary Snooker Champion. <laughs> he has a boutique beer named after him. Uh, and uh, he's become recently notorious in the Marrickville, Newtown area, uh, not so much as hot elbow, but as cool elbow in, in his role as a DJ. Uh, so, uh, I want to introduce him to give the uh, introductory speech, then we'll move into a period of uh, discussion or conversation before we have a, a short break, and then opening it up uh, to questions from the floor. And we'll conclude the session by about 8.15. So, please join me in welcoming Anthony Albanese. Uh, thanks very much, Frank. Um, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country and pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Uh, I acknowledge everyone who's here, but I want to. Um, I think it's pertinent to, to single out Bruce Childs, who's one of the people who was uh, a mentor of uh, me on the day where one year ago uh, we farewelled, I'm sure many of you were at the Sydney Town Hall, we farewelled Tommy Wren. And uh, that was a big loss, I think, for, for our movement and uh, for those who knew him. Um, I want to outline essentially a bit of a, a philosophical position, I guess, to begin of, of where um, I'm coming from. It's some time since I've done politics in the pub, but I, I am old enough and was a young enough activist to have done politics in the pub right here in the Harold Park <laughs> Hotel uh, before it uh, ended its current incarnation. I must take the opportunity, given that Frank is going to get to answer, ask me questions, to, um, to, to be nice to him and to say uh, that I am sorry that that uh, essay didn't quite get handed in potentially on time but it's very hard when you're suspended from entering the university grounds <laughs> to get to hand in your essay uh, as I was for uh, one of my first um, uh, campaigns to support the retention of jobs it was his job yeah. and the job of Gavin Butler and others so I just put that out there to remind you as you're shaping the questions that, uh, you know, cost me a year of my life. Uh, the, uh, my three-year degree became four, because you also, literally, we weren't able to submit uh, essays, go to classes. We were literally under the archaic thing that is Sydney University and the legislation, uh, which is uh, almost like sort of the Vatican in Rome. It's a separate part of the world under a New South Wales Act 
uh, that uh, acts under its own uh, system and they have a right uh, to uh, ban people from entering the grounds as, as we were, um, uh, even though uh, subsequently I think it was found that we were certainly right in defending academic freedom and essentially that's what that struggle was about, it was a struggle of ideas, um, about ideas of what economics is for and economics is about people, it's not something that's abstract and that essentially was the difference um, in the courses and what that struggle was about. And I've taken uh, that view and that education in terms of into my political engagement. I believe that uh, most Australians are pretty simple in terms of philosophy. They just want a better opportunity for their kids and their grandkids than they had. What that means is better economic opportunities, but it also means the sort of world that we live in, a more sustainable world. They want to protect and enhance uh, the natural environment. We need an economy that's inclusive and is sustainable. There is a role for government. What, uh, one of the things I, I studied at, uh, at university was the so-called crowding out thesis, the idea that if the public sector just gets out of the way, then the private sector and the market will sort it all out. Of course, that is an absolute nonsense. And if you look at the global financial crisis, it was not due to government, it was due to markets. It was due to free markets and private greed and corporate capitalism gone crazy that led to literally the collapse from within in the major industrialised economies of the world. And I'm very proud of uh, the fact that uh, we came through that uh, crisis uh, better than any advanced economy in the world. We were one of the few that didn't go into uh, recession and one in which I think the infrastructure investment played a major part of that. I think we have to identify where the Australian economy is going in the future. What are the jobs of the future? What that doesn't mean is the sort of idea that you hear from now and again in terms of innovation will just come in and solve all the problems. Innovation, of course, is important. But it's also important that our economy is diverse, that there are jobs which are blue collar and white collar, that people have the opportunity. Not everyone's going to want to uh, be an IT expert. And we need to insulate ourselves from the shocks that occur in global capitalism by making sure that we have that diverse economy across the board. This week I've met with uh, seafarers on the MV Portland. Uh, they are people who were doing their job, some of them, one of them for 28 years. It essentially is a ship that went from Portland in Victoria, where the alumina refinery is of Alcoa, across to Western Australia to pick up the minerals and back again. Forward, back. What uh, this government has had is uh, an ideological uh, assault on seafarers and on the Australian flag. They introduced legislation uh, last year uh, that was uh, not successful, was rejected in the parliament, that unusually, even work choices sort of pretended it was okay. But this legislation actually had very explicitly in it that it would result in the reflagging of ships from the Australian flag to a foreign flag and the replacement of Australian seafarers on Australian wage rates with foreign seafarers who are exploited on foreign wage rates, some uh, as low as $2 an hour. And this is sort of one approach of the economy that you can have and that the Conservatives have. have. How can we drive down wages? How can we compete in our region on the basis of having the same wages and conditions that they have. That's not the Australian way. What we should be seeking to do is to lift up uh, wages and conditions. And one of the things that, uh, the big distinctions between Australia and the United States is it in part because of the role that the trade union movement have played here historically, but also the role that Labor governments have been able to play as social democratic governments uh, in government, both state and federal, that's put in place appropriate bargaining mechanisms 
is that uh, Australian wage rates have risen substantially and real living standards over the decades since I last spoke uh, at uh, the Harold Park Hotel. Unlike the United States, where because of the weakness of the labour movement, uh, you, you have had a decline in the real living standards and real wages of people in the United States and an absolute underclass uh, living uh, in poverty. That's not to say that poverty is not prevalent here, it certainly is. And there are attacks on working people and many people are exploited. But by and large, in terms of the Australian experience, uh, is far preferable to the US experience. My political engagement and the portfolios, many of which I've held, can be characterised as investing in capital and social capital, i.e. investing in infrastructure but also investing in people. They're the two things that we can do to lift our economy up. As uh, Infrastructure Minister, I'm very proud that uh, we invested more in public transport than all previous governments combined from Federation right through to 2007. We engaged uh, historically consistent with the role of people like Tom Uren and Brian Howe, consistent with the sort of uh, things that uh, I learnt at, uh, at uni in urban and regional economics under Frank. Uh, we engaged in our cities. I established a major cities unit. Um, it uh, produced reports, State of Australian Cities. It identified uh, the real challenges that are there. The last report in particular identified that the jobs growth, because of the changing nature of the economy, a lot of it was in the finance sector, legal services, other services, they tended to be located around the CBDs of our capital cities. That was creating a phenomenon of drive-in, drive-out suburbs and where jobs were increasingly located far away from where the mass of the people live. And that's why public transport is critical. It's why also design of our cities is important. It's why Badgerys Creek Airport is important as a driver of jobs and economic activity in Western Sydney. It's, it's, it's why, in terms of uh, economic activity, uh, we need to make sure that the concept of the 20 minute or 30 minute city, that people can have access to jobs, to health and education services, to recreational services, including the arts and cultural activities, uh, within 20 or 30 minutes of where they live with access by either public transport or active transport, that is bikes or walking. And the design of cities can have a big impact on the quality of life. It's why also the National Broadband Network was so critical. The National Broadband Network of delivering fibre to the home or to the business, not fibre to the fridge and then copper. <laughs> I mean, it, it is extraordinary that in 2016, on Malcolm Turnbull's watch, you know, this is the guy who supposedly understands communications and the new economy, that we have bought 1,800 kilometres of copper of copper. It's like going out and buying a, 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 a beta video player for every Australian. In 2016, it is just absurd. And if we're going to compete in our region, and of course there's a transport dimension to it in terms of uh, people being able to work from home, the nature of work and activity, there's an equity dimension to it as well. Of course, Malcolm Turnbull says that we're going to have a mix of technologies. What that means is that ki the kids who can afford it, uh, such as, you know, sons and daughters of MPs or, or people who are, ha are able to get that access will be able to get the high-speed broadband into their home. But if you can't afford it, you don't get it. To me, uh, the MBN is today what previous generations saw water and electricity as being. An essential of life that everyone should have equal access to and shouldn't be delivered on the basis of income. Yeah, yeah. In terms of education, I'm very proud that uh, last week uh, we announced the Your Child, Our Future policy adopting the Gonski principles. Four and a half billion dollars added in to year five and six, but a plan across the 10 years 
a $37 billion commitment, fully funded, to make sure that people get educational opportunity uh, based upon ability, based upon taking people who are left behind, who need that extra tutoring, who need that extra bit of uh, assistance. And uh, that will make, and is already making, a huge difference. There was a delegation uh, this week down to Canberra of Indigenous kids in the Shoalhaven who, for the first time, were being taught their first language, the language of their people, of their country, who were engaged in education. And uh, there was a fantastic interview on the ABC of a mum talking about her kids uh, who uh, had previously had uh, great difficulties, but the younger ones coming through, the practical difference that it's making. I'm a big supporter of public education. A lot of private schools do the right thing and do great work. But the truth is that most disadvantaged kids end up in public education. And public education is the great equaliser. Uh, it is uh, the, the place where kids of different backgrounds can gather and get uh, that support and engagement. And it should be supported by government. We need also to look at not just schools, but universities, but particularly, I think, at the moment at TAFE. There is a crisis in our vocational education and training system. Uh, governments have, have neglected, or all governments have not done enough, but in particular now, the idea that you would move purely to a for-profit system would be disastrous and would mean uh, that we don't have the skills that we need for the future. So disastrous for the young people, but also disastrous for our national economy that needs those skills. In healthcare, properly funded healthcare ensures in the long run, early intervention saves government money, takes pressure off the system. And uh, we developed a long-term funding principle for health that the government has abandoned with its cuts. Across the board, sustainability is a principle that can no longer be just an add-on. It's got to be a whole-of-government approach to dealing with climate change. One that, yes, has an emissions trading scheme and has a price on carbon, but does more than that as well. That's why I think the renewable energy target of 50% uh, is uh, particularly uh, important. And why, in terms of renewables, if you look at the difference a government can make, there was a 88% drop-off in renewables because of the change of government last year. The industry literally collapsed as a result of the change in government and the lack of certainty that was there for investment. And just today, it's been announced that over 100 scientists who work on climate change will be sacked from the CSIRO. An extraordinary proposition from a bloke who said that uh, he wouldn't lead a party that wasn't serious about taking action on climate change. Well, how do you pay for all of this? The government wants to have a 15% GST, a regressive tax where I pay the same as the pensioners in this room. That's not equitable and that's not a fair taxation system and it's certainly not reformed. At a time when, at a time when 75 millionaires, according to the research that was done uh, by the Australia Institute on behalf of the Community and Public Sector Union, uh, 75 people who earned a total of 195 million dollars paid together less than 100 dollars tax between the lot of them. They spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on accountants and lawyers, but that's not fair. Nor is it fair that this week McDonald's announced that they were able to offshore their tax obligations by shifting funds to Singapore. Nor is it fair that the high end can use superannuation not for their savings, but as a tax evasion measure, as simple as that. So I think there are a range of options available, many of which uh, we have put forward, including on superannuation and on multinationals, to be fairer. I'll conclude uh, with, uh, with this. Um, 
What sort of society do I support? I support an inclusive society. What does that mean? The first thing that it has to mean in a country such as ours, with our heritage, where people will argue about the history, but there's one thing that's certain. You don't have a history of this nation without beginning with the first Australians, with Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders. We are privileged. We are very privileged. Uh, to live in a country with the oldest continuous culture on the planet and we need to finish off the job that was little steps made and I was very proud when Kevin Rudd made his apology but we need to recognise Indigenous Australians in our constitution but importantly we do need to continue to make advances on closing the gap that is just uh, still remains a national stain on, on Australia. We need to address uh, gender issues. When domestic violence is at the rates that it is, uh, that should be a national crisis which attracts far more funding and far more public conversation than is currently occurring. We need to recognise that all people are equal. What that means is marriage equality. I fail to see how we weaken the institution of marriage by extending it. And uh, it seems to me that that's a fairly fundamental principle. The last, but certainly not least, um, is uh, class, often forgotten. We need to talk about the spatial dimension of our cities and our class structures, and we need to address them. If we don't consciously take action on it, you will have cities where you can determine your income by your postcode. One of the things about the inner west here that makes it so attractive is uh, the diverse nature of the community. The truth is that it's becoming less diverse. Mm. Every time someone from a multicultural background sells their house, it's bought by a professional, mm. largely who grew up somewhere else. That's fine, but if the whole reason for those people coming into this community where I grew up disappears, that is the vibrant nature of it, then that will change uh, the character of our suburbs. We have too many suburbs in our outer areas uh, that uh, don't have employment opportunities, that don't have services, that don't have public transport, that don't have the sort of things that you can take for granted if you live in Marrickville or live in Glebe. And one of the things that we need to do to address that is obviously housing affordability. The attack on public housing in Millers Point, where the logic of the principle that says, I can sell that house for three million dollars and buy five houses somewhere else, needs to be addressed. It's a hard argument. It's a hard argument. But it's one that has to be won. Serious is purpose-built housing and one of the things that I say for international visitors who come uh, to Australia from different parliaments or people who I've shown around Sydney and you take it across the Harbour Bridge, isn't it fantastic that public housing tenants live with the view of the harbour, not just the wealthy? And uh, this government's approach that says uh, that would lead you to remove all social housing from areas except for the poorest areas and had that concentration of inequality that not just hurts those people who suffer from that concentration of uh, disadvantage but it also changes the character of the community. I think it hurts everyone when communities are less diverse and less vibrant. Successful cities are inclusive cities and we need to make sure that this city of Sydney, for a start, but other cities around Australia, remain just that, and indeed get much better at that. Thanks, friend. Reading uh, an article actually by uh, an American, sorry, a, a Melbourne-based uh, political sociologist named Peter Beilhart, 
who said that the Labour Party, with which you have a lifetime commitment, you are living Labour, uh, has changed in its character over your lifetime from being a movement to being a party of power. How do you respond to that? Look, I, I don't think that's... One of the things that I think that uh, people on the left sometimes do is, uh, and I'm not saying I'm not guilty of it occasionally, is we romanticise the past. There's this great sort of thing about saying, oh, the good old days. The truth is, the good old days, in the early days, Labor was founded, one of the core principles, of course, was the White Australia policy. Um, in terms of gender equality, those issues, you know, weren't on the table at all. So I think uh, Labor is a, a party of government. Um, that is one of the reasons why I'm in the Labor Party. I make no apologies for that. Um, to me, uh, from the time I was growing up uh, in Piermont Bridge Road, I have said I was raised with three great faiths, the Catholic Church, uh, South Sydney Football Club, and, uh, and the Australian Labor Party. And, you know, everyone in that council housing, it was a real culture. You went along to the Labor Party branch. Why did you do that? In part, the Labor Party looked after you. Um, it was, people knew the difference. Um, I knew the difference when Whitlam was elected. It made a difference to my mum's life and uh, made a difference to healthcare, it made a difference to education in terms of access to university. Uh, it made a practical difference to pensions. They went up. They didn't go up under the Tories. Um, so Labor has always sought and was founded by trade unionists who wanted to exercise political power. I respect people who are a part of other political parties that, that either don't engage in parliamentary politics or who are minority politics or independents. Um, you know, I've worked pretty well, frankly, with the crossbenchers in the last parliament where I had to get five out of seven of them to get anything through. Um, and there were people who are excellent people, you know. Tony Windsor, for example, is a man I think of great integrity. Um, but um, I wouldn't give up the sacrifice um, that you give up, being away from, you know, I haven't been home yet to see the family and all of that. Um, if, um, if I wasn't about making decisions, I want to make decisions, not protest decisions. And you get to make decisions when you're part of a party of government, and that means there's two options in Australia. We're the better one. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, there is a, a, a third option that uh, is going to be challenging you pretty hard in Brainbow at the next election, and that's the Greens. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on your personal relationship with the Greens and uh, more broadly uh, the party's relationship. Because obviously in an election contest, you're combative and competitive. But what are the prospects that I imagine many in this room would we aspire towards for a more cooperative broad left program where the Labour and Greens work well together, as to some extent they did during the, the, the Gillard years. Well, it would be easier if the Greens weren't targeting Labour left seats and no one else. That's the truth. That's the truth. Um, and, and, and in terms of whether well, it was a Labour left candidate, um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the system, yeah, I respect people who make the decision to be in the Greens political party. That's their decision. It's good that people are engaged in the political process. However, the best possible outcome is there's one Green now in the, um, in the House of Representatives. The objective of the Greens is to get two or three at the next election. Um, they might say four or five and be optimistic. We'll see. I'm a part of a party that the objective is to get 76 and to sit around the cabinet table. That's a major difference. Um, you know, there's a role the Greens can play, as do the minor parties in the Senate. Nick Xenophon has a lot of influence. Um, but in the reps now, I think Adam Bang 
is a very decent person who I have a good personal relationship with. Yeah. Um, but his impact in the House of Reps is, you know, not much, frankly. Um, at, at the moment, so, you know, the same impact that Clive Palmer has or, or someone else, but they're not even, there's no prospect of that happening. And, you know, my, my concern is that, that, that what will happen at the next election, as happened at the last election, um, I will be massively outspent by the Greens. Because, because it happened last time, cinema ads, etc. Because the way the public funding works is that the Greens can take the dollars that are cast all around the state, all go in and they can concentrate that on one seat, or maybe two, Grainler and Sydney. And uh, Richmond, I think, they'll probably target on the North Coast. Um, we can't do that. I've been outspent at every election campaign uh, by my political opponents. I will be next time uh, as well. I didn't have billboards. I didn't have uh, the posters on every single telephone thing. I didn't have ads in cinema. I didn't have the sort of resources that they're able to have. And that makes some logical sense for them to do so. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where preferences will go as well. Um, you know, the, the, the possible, this is a sophisticated political audience. You know, the fix I worry about being in is a, um, is one whereby the Liberals preference the Greens in the three or four seats that are necessary and the Greens don't exchange preferences in a range of seats like Robertson and Dobell, etc. That's the deal that's on the table. They're the discussions that are taking place. And, you know, if people think that you'll have a more progressive parliament with me not in it, well, that's a decision that people are entitled to make. In the past, people, including members of the Greens, I know in this area, vote for me, even though they vote for the Greens in the Senate, and even though they go out and hand out for the Greens. There are a range of them do that. Um, oh, that's probably a pretty sensible thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> How courageous is Labor going to be in the next election in terms of its uh, program? I mean, is, is there a prospect of a, of a coherent and comprehensive uh, new nation-building program? I mean, as a previous infrastructure minister, this is dear to your heart. You talked about cities, regional development. It's possible to put all that together in terms of a a very inspiring nation-building program, particularly at a time of general economic difficulty. But it, it would need to be linked to a progressive tax reform agenda too, that would have to be equally audacious. I think that just saying multinationals ought to pay a fairer share of tax isn't going to cut it. And just opposing the GST isn't probably going to cut it either, unless there's some comprehensive program of progressive tax reform on the agenda. But that, as you know, creates all sorts of uh, political uncertainties about how the electorate is going to respond. How courageous is, is Labor going to be in, in these conditions? Negative gearing. Well, we'll see. But we, we've said, for example, um, on negative gearing, we've said that we'll, we'll look at those issues. Um, we've already announced, I think pretty courageously or well, in advance, a very specific proposal for multinationals, a very specific proposal for superannuation. One of the things that I did at national conference was move a resolution about the Buffett rule. Uh, that comes about because Warren Buffett, you know, one of the wealthiest fellows in the world, um, <laughs> discovered that his secretary basically was paying more tax than he was. And, and uh, I proposed a thing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, in terms of fairness in the system, there are a range of things that I think should be looked at. Now, that can be difficult um, in terms of uh, from opposition in terms of resources. But one of the things that we have is the parliamentary budget office, which is able to work out costings of policies, and uh, you know, oppositions and governments don't get away with just making promises without having uh, to find the funding for them. 
Um, the, uh, the cigarette tax increases that we put forward is, I think, courageous. That will annoy many of our traditional supporters. And uh, I understand that. Uh, the measures where we have said that we will not support will cut the funding of the direct action model of climate change, which frankly is producing very little benefit for a lot of money and essentially just subsidising uh, big capital that doesn't need it, um, is, uh, is, I think, a, a courageous move as well. Um, at this stage in the cycle, the fact that, you know, at least, you know, I think potentially you look in the election about August, September, I think we have a lot of policy out there. The education policy um, is a substantial commitment to make. Um, we've said that you know, on the MBN uh, we'll have uh, five bit of the premise. We've identified a range of infrastructure projects. I'm in Melbourne tomorrow doing a forum on public transport. We've said that uh, we will support uh, the Melbourne Metro as our number one priority for Victoria. Um, the Cross River Rail project in Brisbane, important public transport projects that were out there already very early on, uh, committing to and campaigning on. So I, I certainly hope that uh, we have uh, a, uh, a, a program that is uh, substantial, but I think the evidence is there at this stage in the cycle that we've done a lot more than just oppose and I went to the National Press Club more than a year ago with the 10-point plan for cities, for example, uh, that we've gone away and then put detail on each of the 10 um, headlines, if you like, uh, that we put out there. And that, that has caused a response. I mean, the government, uh, in response, you know, a year later, appointed a minister for cities. That didn't work out so well for them. <laughs> and they haven't bothered to replace uh, Jamie Briggs um, because they didn't basically give him anything to do. There's no department, there's no major cities unit, there's no program that he was in charge of. So I think you can set the agenda if you're prepared to be bold and get out there and do it from uh, opposition, but the truth is it's going to be tough. Um, the whole country breathed a sigh of relief when Tony Abbott uh, got uh, axed by his own party. Woo! And uh, that has meant, uh, for some, had that response and then had a look at Malcolm. But for many, they had that response and then just turned off. But essentially, the policies are the same. That's the big problem. Different salesperson, same policies. And uh, now you have uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, in conflict with Tony Abbott and a lot of dissent between, within the Liberal Party. Um, but you also have Malcolm Turnbull in conflict with himself on climate change, on the National Broadband Network, on marriage equality, on the Republic, for goodness sake, um, on all of these issues in conflict with himself. So I think there is a, a substantial... Uh, you know, I, I certainly don't... I'm not one who writes off this election. I believe every election is winnable and we can win this election, and we need to win this election, because uh, the, the prospect of, look at what they're doing to you know, the shipping sector, for example, it will disappear. It will disappear, and it will be so hard uh, to get it back um, if uh, this mob, uh, still with their, their hard right agenda, um, where Malcolm Turnbull's the figurehead, but the same agenda, um, get re-elected. Finally, then, let me raise that delicate question of the leadership. Now, uh, you nearly became the leader. Uh, what's uh, Bill's prospects? More tangents. Look, I um, I grew up round the road here where there was. You know, more chance where I grew up of going to jail than getting into Parliament. Um, and, uh, you know, I never saw myself as a leadership candidate. Um, I saw myself as being a team player. Um, circumstances were such that 
Um, I was encouraged to run by a whole lot of people inside and outside the, the Labor Party uh, for the leadership. We changed the system, uh, myself and Kevin Rudd, to democratise the party and to engage the membership. If I hadn't have run, there wouldn't have been a ballot and you would have had that reform from some of the, uh, the power brokers in the Labor Party are horrified by the idea of giving rank and file members a say in the most important position that the Labor Party has. And I have no doubt that if there had not been a ballot, that reform would have disappeared. Um, some of them said very explicitly that would happen. Um, that encouraged me to run, <laughs> to make sure that it was entrenched. Um, and, uh, you know, I ran. Um, I was uh, humbled by the, the support that I got. I didn't expect that. Um, the truth is that every party political machine in terms of the state branches and offices didn't support me. Um, so, you know, that was starting up uh, against it, against the odds. But the membership had their say, and by and large, they, in the comfort of their own homes, filled out ballot papers uh, as they saw, saw fit. And it was a very good exercise, I think. It's one of the reasons why uh, there was such a change in the political dynamic when Abbott, after Abbott was re-elected. Because I think that people quite rightly marked us down uh, because we were seen to be more concerned about ourselves than them. And that's what they'll do when political parties fight internally. What they saw with myself and Bill was two people who weren't attacking each other, but were putting forward different policy positions, doing it in a sophisticated way, doing it pretty publicly. Let's talk about brave. Um, you know, there were people who said, you cannot, you know, you can't do Q&A with two Labor candidates with questions from whoever. Uh, you can't do the sort of forums that we had that were broadcast live about campaign launches broadcast live all around the country. I went to every state and territory, uh, as did Bill. And I think that put us on a positive footing from day one as a new opposition. It meant that rather than looking at the past and who supported whom, in what ballot, in what year, we were looking forward. And I think, you know, I'm glad that I ran and I'm glad I played a role in that. Um, Bill um, was successful, I didn't receive the support that I needed to. I was, you know, a few Why votes not? short. A few votes short. Well, I, I voted for myself, I assure you. <laughs> so I'm probably not the best person to answer that. We lost you, answer it. So, uh, you know, people, it, it, it is what it is. Um, and uh, I moved on and from day one, I haven't looked back. I haven't run around and complained. I've got on with the business um, of doing the best job that I could in the job that I've got, which is substantial um, in terms of portfolio-wise, in terms of my electorate, um, and, you know, I'll be campaigning uh, to make sure that I'm a minister after the next election in a Labor government led by Bill. It's a lot better position than being leader of the opposition because you can actually do things, and, and that is my objective and uh, I've made that uh, very clear um, from day one.